What's going on smart people? Bringing you another episode of Tensor Calculus for Physics Majors. In the last video we introduced the metric tensor. We learned that we could relate some kind of distance squared to coordinate displacements by having those coordinate displacements acted on by the metric tensor giving us this kind of squared distance. Today we're going to see how we can apply this concept to special relativity in the space-time interval. Then we'll talk about four vectors for a little bit and lastly we'll wrap things up by starting to discuss vectors with upper versus lower indices. Now I actually am going to get to the concept of a four vector now. In a little bit we'll talk more about transformation properties sort of in the Lorentz transform and we'll see gamma again. But for now we're just interested in the space-time interval and in the previous video we know that we could collect our dx dy dz's into some kind of displacement vector that I'm still going to index with a little i. So we'll call it dxi is equal to our collection of dx dy dz. This is our dx1, dx2, dx3, which is just our dr. In special relativity, so this initially was used to help calculate our little squared distance, and in special relativity our events can be separated into both space and time, so we tack on another component, hence why it's called a four vector, where the first component is now a temporal one, it's in terms of time, and whenever we're dealing with four vectors, we normally index them with a Greek index, some Greek letter. So we'll call that dx mu is equal to c dt, so this still has units of distance, uh, dx dy dz, which is equal to dx zero. So now we have our index running from zero to three instead of from one to three. And dx one dot 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 dx three. And we can rewrite this as c dt comma dr. Now any introduction to special relativity will tell you that the the square of the proper time times the speed of light of course can be expressed as, I'll write that as c d tau squared is equal to c squared dt squared minus the dot product of the spatial bit. So this is equal to c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. Another question is, is there a way to express this in terms of the metric like, like how we're familiar with it? So if we want to say, can I write c d tau squared equal to g mu nu times uh, dx mu dx nu? Well, if we look at this, we can see that, that we can actually construct that pretty easily if we use a metric tensor of this form. So here is the matrix representation where we pretty much should have a diagonal of ones because we just have uh, same times same. The only difference is we have relative minus signs for the spatial bit as opposed to the temporal bit. So we get a one, zero, 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 minus one, zero, 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 minus one, zero, 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 minus one. If we multiply this out by our uh, coordinate displacements, then we get the correct square of the proper time. Cool, so that worked. This Minkowski metric is sometimes denoted with an eta instead, eta mu nu, uh, just to show we're, we're in flat space time, we're not doing anything funky with the metric. But the fact that we have a positive sign in the time part and negative signs in the spatial part, that's a convention. It's a metric signature. Sometimes you'll see it denoted as a plus, minus, minus, minus. Uh, but that's a convention. Other physicists might use, say, the minus, plus, plus, plus. The important part isn't that people use different signatures. The important part is that there's always a relative minus sign for the spatial versus the time part. And this illustrates the need for a type of distinction that will eventually get us to subscripts and superscript indices when describing different types of vectors. Before we get into upper, lower indices, contravariant, covariant vectors, let's talk a bit about four vectors first and what makes something a four vector. If I have some, some four vector that I'm saying mu, well, we know how regular vectors transform, right? If we have some vector and, and let's call it some primed frame, we know it's going to be the same, this vector in the unprimed frame times its transformation coefficient, which I'll write as, you know, dx, uh, mu prime over dx uh, nu. So we're summing over this, this is giving us our new vector. The thing that makes something a four vector is when it transforms this way where these transformation coefficients are parts of the Lorentz transformation. 
Now, when we're talking about things like velocities, you know, you can, you know, velocity is displacement over time. Great, but when we're in relativity, well, what are we differentiating? We're differentiating with respect to whose time? Whose time do we differentiate with respect to? Not to mention, now we have four coordinates, so it's a velocity through a four-dimensional space-time. So, if we want to ask that question of, you know, what is, what is a four velocity? That's what I want to get at. Something that is a four velocity that still transforms as a four vector. Let's call that uh, u. We'll do it u superscript mu. What is that? Can I say that that's just the derivative of our coordinates with respect to one of the reference frames time? I don't know. Well, let's write out these coordinates. We know that this is equal to, so x mu is our collection of ct, x, y, z. And if we differentiate this with respect to time, so dx mu over dt, well, right off the bat, the first term, the t goes away, and we get a c, and we don't actually have to go any further. The components of a four vector follow a certain prescription on how they will transform into a different reference frame. That's how they're defined to be a four vector. But here, when we take the derivative with respect to time of this, we get c as one of the components of the four vector. c is by one of the postulates of special relativity, an invariant quantity. It does not change between reference frames. So implicitly what we're saying is that one of the components of the four vector doesn't transform at all. It just stays that. These transformation coefficients are just one all the time. That doesn't make sense. So if you're saying that the component of a, tr of a four vector can't transform, it's just not a four vector. So taking the derivative of this with respect to time is not the way to go. We don't get a four vector when we do that. So the way that we do retain our four vectorness is instead of differentiating with respect to time, we differentiate with respect to the proper time. So we have a four vector up top, we differentiate with respect to some invariant quantity, that's gonna give us a four vector in the end. So we differentiate with respect to proper time. Uh, but this, these coordinates also depend on time, so in order to do this, we need to use some chain rule. So this is equal to dx mu dt, which we just kind of calculated, times chain rule, so dt over d tau. And let's just call this the, the regular velocity. We'll denote it with a v. So this is equal to v mu dt over d tau. And now we just got to calculate whatever, whatever this is. So let's take a look at our space-time interval real quick. We know that c squared uh, d tau squared is equal to c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. Okay, let's go ahead and factor out our dt squared from everything, and we get that c squared d tau squared is equal to dt squared c squared minus, well, if we're dividing by dt squared on all of these, it's dx dt times dx dt, dy dt times dy dt. These are just, that's just the velocity. That's just the velocity squared. So this is just minus v squared. And we can factor out our c squared. So this is equal to c squared dt squared 1 minus v squared over c squared. And then the c squareds cancel and we get the d tau squared is equal to d t squared times 1 minus v squared over c squared. Divide both sides this stuff over, you guys know algebra, and we get 1 over uh, 1 minus v squared over c squared is equal to dt squared over proper time squared. So dt over d tau is just equal to the Lorentz factor, gamma. That's pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool when I first saw it. So that tells us that our four velocity is just equal to, uh, so it's equal to gamma times v mu. So there we have something that still preserves uh, our vector being a four vector. And this is gonna be kind of a recurring theme of something that we want to preserve. We have some vector, we have some tensor, and when we take derivatives of it, is the thing at the end still going to be a tensor or a vector? Or do we have to change things? Eventually we'll get to that once we get the covariant derivatives. And just to be super explicit, just because we've come this far, I don't want to rush through anything. So I'm saying that u mu is equal to gamma, 
times whatever our velocities in the lab frame were in the first place. So in this case, the time component, we already found out our dct dt is just going to be c, and then we've just got our velocity vector in the lab frame. Okay, now let's actually talk about upper and downstairs indices. So far, we've been dealing with vectors and tensors that have superscripts as indices, and we know that the subscript indices things exist, we just haven't been working with them, because for Euclidean spaces, it's a distinction that's kind of unnecessary. We have metrics that are just positive terms, and our scalar products that are just a sum of products of the components. It's easy, but as we saw for the Minkowski metric, that's where things got a little bit different. Our metric had you know, minus terms in it, it corresponded to scalar products that had minus terms in it, and for even more complicated geometries, things get even weirder. And instead of just redefining the scalar product every time we have a different geometry, we'd like to be able to absorb all that messy stuff into the metric. Where do upper and lower indices come in? Well, let's take a look at the space-time interval one more time. We're going to define it in terms of ds squared is equal to g mu nu times dx mu times dx new. I'm very self-conscious about my mu's, guys. Be nice. Uh, let's just take a look at this term here. Okay, the Einstein summation convention says that if you have repeated indices, one downstairs, one upstairs, you sum over that index. We've got an upstairs index here, which means that if we're ending up with something with zero indices, this must be some uh, quantity with only a downstairs index that I sum over. So I'm going to call that I'm going to call that dx nu, and I'm going to say that that is equal to whatever this is. So g mu nu dx mu. And we're free to look at whatever component we'd like. For example, let's consider the case where we're back in special relativity and we're looking at the time component, which would be uh, nu equal to zero. And let's work in a rectangular, just a Cartesian kind of coordinate system. So we've got dx zero is equal to g mu zero dx mu and we're summing over mu so this is equal to uh, g zero zero dx zero plus g one zero dx zero nope dx one plus d g uh, two zero dx two and lastly g three zero dx3. Well, we already know that with the Minkowski metric, the off-diagonal terms are zero, so all of these terms are zero, and we get that dx0 is equal to g00, which for the Minkowski metric, remember the first component is just one, so we get that this is equal to dx0 with the superscript. So this is equal to CT. So in this case, the subscript is equal to the superscript. But if we go to, say, dx1, dx1, well, the only term that's going to survive is the diagonal part with the metric. So this is going to equal g11 dx1. But with the Minkowski metric, g11 is minus. So this is equal to minus dx1. Uh, and the same goes for dx2, dx3, etc. So we say that the d xi's are dual to the dxi sub superscripts. And uh, if we're working in a Euclidean space, the distinction is redundant because we have all of these positives in the metric and they don't change the signs. For the uh, Minkowski metric, a pseudo Riemannian geometry, the duals differ by a sign and there's going to be a bunch of different distinctions depending on the geometry that you're actually working with. So we've established that vectors with superscripts as indices are determined by your coordinates, and we now know that their duals are derived using the metric. Now, vectors that have superscripts as indices for their components, those are the components of contravariant vectors, and their duals, the ones with subscripts, are sometimes called dual vectors or components of covariant vectors or components of one forms. It goes by many names. Now we're going to talk about covariant and contravariant vectors a lot more in the next video, but now I want to actually revisit bracket notation because we can express our invariant uh, space-time interval in terms of it. So we can write ds squared equal to, in Dirac's bracket notation, dx dx, and now we know that this is equal to g mu nu dx mu dx nu, which is equal to dx mu, dx mu. Awesome. And uh, this kind of, this, this really 
started to make sense for me because in things like quantum mechanics, when you have a ket, that ket lives in a Hilbert space and its associated bra lives in a dual Hilbert space. So this is kind of one way of looking at that. So similarly, any vector and its dual can be expressed in terms of this. So yeah, AB is equal to G mu nu, uh, A mu, B mu, B nu, sorry, which is equal to a mu, B mu. Awesome. Last topic of the video. One natural way of looking at vectors with superscript indices are vectors that have some kind of displacement in the numerator. Like if we were to have dx over dt, or the time derivative of dx dt, you know, dv dt, or something like that. These have displacements in the numerator. It would be nice if we could have some natural way of looking at vectors who have subscripts, uh, instead of just having to construct them from those with superscripts. And the natural way of doing that is by putting the displacement and the denominator. So let's take a look at the gradient. If I want to find, say, the ith component of the gradient of some scalar function, some scalar, uh, so del i of phi, we know that that's just the derivative of phi with respect to the ith coordinate. And in a Euclidean space, we're used to thinking of the Euclidean gradient in terms of a change in distance, but it doesn't have to be that. And if we step away from the whole Euclidean mindset, we go over to a generalized coordinate, some of, something that doesn't necessarily have to have units of distance, then we replace this i with a mu. So if we want to talk about, I'm going to erase this real quick, del mu of phi equal to d phi over dx mu. And the reason I'm doing this is because if you talk about like gradients in cylindrical coordinates or spherical, you get these like one over distance factors that are just there because we know in Euclidean space our gradient corresponds to a change in distance. But away from that, we just want to talk about a change in this generalized coordinate. It doesn't necessarily have to have units of inverse distance. You might see this written a couple of ways. So it's, sometimes it can be confusing because you have displacement in the denominator, but a superscript, maybe that confuses people. So some people explicitly write the subscript with the partial to say this is this is something with downstairs components, which I personally like. And some people write just the function and then a comma, which says I'm taking a partial derivative and the index immediately following is the coordinate you're taking the derivative with respect to. Uh, so let's let's see how this thing transforms. So if I want to go from some say x x nu coordinates into some x prime mu coordinates, where these coordinates are functions of the old one, and I'm transforming a partial derivative, well, that's just chain rule, right? So we can write this as uh, our new transformed. Uh, this is going to be d phi d x prime mu. That's what we want to end with. And we should start with the older one, so we should have d phi over dx nu. Okay, now we have this in the downstairs, so if we're summing over nu, so we shouldn't have any, so there should be upstairs here, dx nu, and then we need a dx prime mu in the denominator, so that goes here. That's how I always remember what goes upstairs, what goes downstairs, is I write these ones first, and then I say, well, I need to get rid of that one, so that must go in the upstairs. Or if I'm dealing with contravariant vectors, it's the opposite. So this is how this gradient transforms, and this is what we're going to use as the prototype for how all dual vectors transform. So that tells me that if I have some vector component a mu, that is equal to a mu. This is confusing because I just went the other way. Let me write this as a mu, and then a nu is equal to dx nu dx mu. So we're summing over nu, that leaves something that only has mu dependence, uh, that coordinate dependence, awesome. And there we have it. I know that this was kind of a long video and covered a bunch of topics, but I hope this video was helpful to a lot of you. In the next video, we'll be talking about more in depth of contravariant, covariant vectors and some tensor algebra and really getting into the meat that will take us so much farther. Then we'll be able to talk about derivatives of tensors, covariant derivatives, Christoffel symbols, Things are about to start getting really interesting, so I'm excited for it. Let me know in the comments section if you like the video, and I'll see you guys there.